Good morning. Uh, it's a good day to, to be a father. I was just thinking a little bit earlier about uh, a shirt. The girls, I've got five daughters. And when I tell a lot of guys that, they go, really? And uh, the girls got me a shirt quite a while back uh, that said on there, it said, you can't scare me. I've got five daughters. And so... Uh, uh, I thought that was pretty good, but uh, it's good to be here this morning, and I hadn't preached uh, for about a little over a year, I guess. Glad to be up here to share a little bit with you today, and uh, if you'll notice on the bulletin, actually the the main texts are going to be from 1 John, the introduction is going to be from 2 Corinthians there, but let's pray as we begin. Father... uh, Lord, uh, I'm so weak, we are all so weak, and Lord, you are strong, I just pray that uh, you would guide my words today, Father, that uh, the words would penetrate each of our hearts and would move us, Lord, to just uh, a closer walk with you, to just uh, take a look at our lives before you, and uh, we just uh, pray these things in Christ's name, Amen. I'm going to do something a little different. Normally, I like to take a passage and just work through it verse by verse and, you know, piecing it out and, and stuff. But uh, I'm going to do something a little bit different than what I normally do. We're going to look at some stuff in 2 Corinthians as an introduction, and then we're going to go to uh, the book of 1 John. But I want you to think about uh, all the people in your life today uh, that you have a good bit of contact with, whether it be, you know, friends, maybe it be family. It'd be work, maybe it's neighbors. And how many of those people would you say they believe in Jesus? And how many of them maybe would you question whether or not they were truly a child of God? You know, James 2.19 says, You believe that there is one God, the demons also believe and tremble. While, it's, while it is changing, the, the culture in our United States for a long time has been favorable toward the person who believes in Jesus. Uh, the cost of verbalizing that you're a Christian is not all that significant nowadays. And I, I think it's, it's beginning to change more, though. Uh, however, the, the cost may be much greater for the one who lives biblically today. So we ask the question, you know, are there many of those who are around us who are professors only? They profess to know Christ, but they're not truly a child of God. And, and maybe even for some of you today, the question might be, you know, am I just a professor? Am I just one who says I know Christ, but I truly don't? Well, Paul wrote his two letters uh, to the Corinthians probably just around 25 years after the, the great event of Pentecost, uh, where there was a great movement by the Spirit. And in these two letters, Paul addresses many issues within the Corinthian fellowship. While Paul speaks positively of the Corinthians, there were a lot of definite areas that, from, that they were straying from God's will that gave Paul great concern. He understood that true believers would sometimes struggle with sinful attitudes and actions in their lives. However, he also knew that the true believer was a transformed person and that continuing in sin and the ways of the flesh and the world was not truly characteristic of the child of God. Therefore, he challenged them to seriously evaluate their lives. Uh, a number of years ago, as I don't know, as I was just living my life and working and this and that, uh, I began to see more and more people around me who professed to know Christ, but uh, and believe in Jesus, but they didn't have fruit that confirmed that confession, that profession of Christ, and. I don't know, I mean, it was four or five years ago, I, I wrote a track. And it was called The Test of Life. And the track, uh, the track to basically deals with understanding truths that we see, for, that we see John in 1 John pointedly expressed to us. And uh, he gives us certain tests that will be met by the true believer to some extent. But before we go into deeper into 1 John, we're going to take a, a little close look, more close look at uh, Paul's challenge. So if you're not in 2 Corinthians, go ahead and turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. We'll start at verse 19. 
All this time you've been thinking that we are defending ourselves to you. Actually, it is in the sight of God that we have been speaking in Christ and all for your upbuilding, beloved. For I'm afraid that perhaps when I come, I may, I may find you to be not what I wish and, you, and may be found by you to be not what you wish. That perhaps there will be strife, jealousy, anger, tempers, disputes, slanders, gossip, arrogance, disturbances. I am afraid that when I come again, my God may humiliate me before you and I may mourn over many of those who have sinned in the past and have not repented of the impurity, immorality and sensuality which they have practiced. This is the third time I am coming to you. Every fact is to be confirmed by the testimony of two or three witnesses. I have previously said when present the second time, and though now absent, I say in advance to those who have sinned in the past and to all the rest as well, that if I come again, I will spare, I will not spare anyone. Since you are seeking for the proof of Christ who speaks in me and who is not weak toward you, but mighty in you, for indeed he was crucified because of weakness, yet he lives because of the power of God. For we also are weak in him, yet we will live with him because of the power of God directed towards you. Test yourselves to see if you are in the faith. Examine yourselves. Or do you not recognize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail the test? You know, Paul had a lot of concern uh, about the Corinthian believers. And at the end of this, his letter... Uh, he doesn't beat around the bush in talking to them, and he gives a very direct challenge to them. You know, he's basically saying, you know, there are, there are things in your life, and he mentions some of this, in your lives that cause me to question the reality of your faith. He uses a, a couple of words here in, in verse 5 there. there. There are two words that are synonyms. He says, test and examine. The word test is a word that means to test something to... Uh, Evaluate or understand the nature or quality of that thing. It's used in Hebrews eleven seventeen in a reference to Abraham, where it's talking about he was tested by God to confirm or to, uh, uh, fig, you know, to des describe the nature of, of Abraham's faith. It's used in Revelation two two, where the Ephesian church tested certain men, calling themselves apostles, uh, and they found them not to be of God. The other word, examine, examine yourselves, means to, to test to see something, whether or not something is, is genuine. Uh, and it has the idea that if, if it is genuine, then there is a sense of approval or confirmation. And, and that's used in a number of passages by Paul and other places also. But Paul exhorts them to, to, look at, to look at their lives and to put it to test. He says, test to see if, you sell, if yourselves are in the faith. And then he says, whether or not you recognize about yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you. He's clearly referring to the question or not of whether or not they have genuine faith, whether they have truly been joined in union to Christ. When the life, professing, life of a professing believer becomes such that there is little or no fruit, there becomes doubt as to whether they are in the faith that Christ is truly united to them. If you remember the parable of the sower in uh, Mark chapter 4, you know, the seed was, Satan snatches up some of the seed, but some falls in the rocky soil, some falls in the thorns grow up, and then there's the one with good soil. You know, three of those have seemingly accepted the word, right? It says they receive the word. But only one ended up having lasting fruit. So I think we could say that there are many professors of faith, uh, but there are few that are truly chosen by God. Paul understood that true believers would sometimes struggle with sinful attitudes and actions in their lives. However, he also knew that the believer was and is a transformed person. And that the continuing sin and the ways of the flesh in the world was not characteristic of the child of God. Just to say that again, to reemphasize that. So we're going to look at, though, now 1 John. We're going to look to the Apostle John to get some further understanding of that. If you want to turn to the book of 1 John. And we're going to kind of do, do a little survey through it. And we're going to bring out some things uh, 
that relate to what Paul has said here. Throughout the book of 1 John, we see certain characteristics that identify the true child of God. 1 John 5.13, if you look at the end of the book, he says, uh, he tells them that he has written these things, these things I've written to you so that you may know that you have eternal life. You know, he's not wanting to place doubt unless doubt is net really needed, but he's wanting to give them confirmation and confidence concerning their relationship with God. And, uh, you know, he says, I'm giving you these tests so that you can have confidence and that you are possessors of eternal life. You could call these tests, you could call them proofs, you could call them indicators of life. And But as we look at this today, I encourage you to look at these tests of life and understand how they may apply to your particular situation. Uh, there could be someone here today who may need to examine their own life to see if you truly have eternal life, if you truly have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Or it may be for many of us that we have family, friends, like I mentioned, neighbors, workmates, whatever, who profess to know Christ, but there's little or no fruit there, that this could be a tool that you could use in, in ministering to them. But then for all of us, I think, you know, who profess and are truly believers, uh, and this is going to confirm to us our, our, our relationship with him, Hopefully we can just take the truths that are here and we can further apply them so that we might have just a deeper walk with Christ. And one thing I want to clarify, and we have to be careful here, is I don't want to look at these uh, tests as a checklist. You know, check, check, that decides one way or the other I'm a believer. You know, but as truths, as truths that will expose the true condition of your heart and life. Uh, these tests are not things that we, you know, in a sense, need to do. They are evidences of a true, genuine faith. The root issue is not whether or not all these things are evident, but is there a real saving relationship with Jesus Christ that will show itself in these different ways? You know, growing up with a, a lot of different things and, and being around certain things, legalistic perspectives and trying to sift and evaluate and go through all that, uh, I think the Lord's taught me that many times, you know, people think that the Christian life is a pattern of life. It's a pattern of living. But the, Christ, the Christian life, the Christianity is not a pattern of life. It's union with the person of life. And because Christ is in us and he has changed us, and he's renewed us, we are a different person. It is not something that we just do and we go out and do this and do that. The book of 1 John has many exhortations uh, directed at the daily walk of the believer. Many believe that uh, the heresy, uh, maybe you've heard of Gnosticism, or uh, that this false teaching was influencing the church at the time of John, and, and some of what he says is addressing that. Uh, just a little bit of background, the, the Gnostics, uh, they believe that knowledge was superior to morality, uh, and that only a few could attain to this higher spiritual knowledge. And they also believe that the, the spiritual realm is good, but the physical, the material realm is evil. So they, they draw the conclusion that God didn't create the material realm. And that they also believed along with that, that the, the spirit and the body were distinct. So the body could fulfill its evil desires and you could still be pure in your spirit. And because they believe that uh, material was physical, Christ did not actually take on human flesh. He only seemed to take on human flesh. So we can kind of keep a little bit in, in mind, and I might refer just a little bit of it as we work through the book. So as you see on your notes, we're going to look at nine different tests or indicators or proofs that John brings before us uh, to give us confidence in our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And you're going to see that a number of these overlap each other. They're going to overlap, and they'll be very similar in certain ways. And some of them are going to be, uh, he's, he's not going to deal with them near as significantly. So we'll just keep that in mind as we look at these. The first one is the test of light. 
chapter 1, verses 5 through 7. This is the message we have heard from him and announced to you that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. His first test, in the sense that John gives, is a very basic one. And he says that God is light and there's no darkness at all in God. God's nature is characterized by light. The word that's used here is used like about 70 times in the New Testament, but John uses it more than anybody. He uses it, I think, about 26 times or so. Uh, and uh, we see in, in Matthew, it says the people in Matthew 4.16, I'm going to be giving quite a few uh, cross verses if anybody wants to write them down. I didn't put them in the notes there, but... Uh, it says, the people were sitting in darkness. This is a quote from Isaiah 9. We're sitting in darkness, saw a great light. And those who were sitting in the land and shadow of death, upon them a light dawn. And I think this is a reference to Christ. Christ is the light, light coming to darkness. And as we see here in 1 John, that light is often specifically contrasted with darkness. Light was the first aspect of creation. Uh, it's used to denote Purity, and it's used to denote truth. Light is opposed to darkness. John chapter 3, this is the judgment, that the light is coming to the world, and men love the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light, for the fear that his deeds will be exposed. But he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. The light is opposite of evil and unrighteousness. The light is opposed to what is false. The light brings righteousness and understanding and discernment. And then again in John 1, verse 4 through 9, referring to Christ, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There came a man sent from God, whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify about the light so that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. There was the true light, which coming into the world enlightens every man. So what characterizes man? Man is characterized by darkness, right? And light then reveals the character of man's nature. Uh, I always like the, the example Illustration of if you got two rooms next to each other and one it has a bright light in it and one of them is you know completely dark and the other one and you open the door, what normally happens? The light room doesn't become dark really, does it? The dark room becomes light and whatever is in there is exposed and you get a good picture from that. It causes man the light causes man to see his sinfulness because he, it is compared with the holiness and the purity of God. So life is associated uh, uh, with light. Life is associated with life. And death is associated with darkness. And we see in Matthew 5, I mean, you're familiar with some of these verses, a, a reference to believers. Remember uh, the song we used to sing, maybe some of you sang with your kids, this little light of mine from Matthew 5, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. So that which is God's nature, light, should characterize his children. So God's nature is light. He's the source of light. He's the source of truth and righteousness. And he is in complete contrast to darkness, evil, and sin. Notice that John says, if we say, this whole idea that I've been mentioning about professing, there were some who might say this was true about them. He says, if we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. John is contrasting that person's, their, their profession with their actual, the reality of their life, what is practiced in their life. 
You know, words mean little if there's no fruit, you know, to back them up. And the words that John uses here are they're all in the present tense. And it's so it's speaking about an ongoing characteristic of our lives. Fellowship. He says, if we say we have fellowship with him, with Christ, fellowship carries the the root idea of this word is kind of the idea of commonality, of sharing in common. And so it has the idea to, to be in union, to be in relationship with Jesus Christ. And to be in fellowship with Christ, I think, also means that we we share in his nature and character. We don't we don't become God, but we share in his nature and character. We will we will be like him because he has entered into our life and he has changed us. Second, Peter one, three and four. Peter says, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. For by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. So to walk in the light then is to to have a heart and a life of purity and holiness uh, and a life that walks in the truth. It is a love for what is pure and good and wholesome and a life that turns away from darkness, sin and falsehood. And a lot of these things we could go into a a lot more specific application, but because we're going to cover quite a few of them, I'm not going to do that. Hopefully you can draw some conclusions and some uh, application in your own mind, your own life as we look at these. So the walk of light that we've talked about confirms our fellowship with him. And he he clearly defines the the light, the walk of light. In verse 7 he says, if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light. He's wanting us to look at the life of Jesus Christ and that we are to be characterized by Christ's likeness. If we do not walk in this way, if our walk is not pure and holy, then he's basically saying what? The profession is baseless. What does he say? He says, we lie and we do not practice the truth. One is is blinded or fooled if he thinks that he is saved and his life has never been changed. His life has not ever been characterized by the light. Verse 7. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Those whose life is demonstrated by the light of God, they have fellowship with one another. They share in common the same light and life of God. There is union with God and with one another. There is a a common bond. And notice he says the blood of Jesus, his son, is cleansing us from all sin. We, we see a, an accompanying condition of the walk of light. And we need to be careful how we understand this. Um, throughout what we're going to see throughout uh, his letter, John is conveying these different tests of life. Qualities or characteristics that confirm the presence of life in uh, a person. And his purpose is not to show... You know, right here, it almost seems like it's saying, if I walk in the light, then I'm going to I'm going to be cleansed. It's like it's almost like it's conditional, like you have to do something. You have to walk in the light to be cleansed of your sin. And but what John is doing throughout the book is his purpose is not to show that one gains or achieves or secures eternal life or a relationship with God by maintaining certain qualities or characteristics Uh, His purpose is to show that one who demonstrates these qualities or characteristics is proven to be a possessor of the true life of God. Kind of like if you looked at John 8.31, Jesus says, If you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed. I mean, we don't believe that you... Only when you continue in the word up to the day you die, then you are truly a believer. You're a a true disciple, right? So Jesus is not saying to them, only if you continue in my word, uh, then you will be uh, my child. He's basically saying the true child of God will continue in the word. 
And, and that's the idea that we get here when he's talking about uh, the blood uh, cleansing us. The true child of God who walks in the light can be confident that his, his sin is being cleansed by the blood of Christ. So John's point is the one who is walking in the light confirms that he is truly in relationship with God. And the one who is in relationship with God can be assured that all his sin is being cleansed. So the first test, the true believer walks in the light as Christ is in the light. The second test, the test of confession. Verses 8 through 2-2. If we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we are confessing our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. As the true believer lives out his life, he will recognize sin in his life. He will see where he falls short. Of God's desire. You know, and it's possible that John is addressing this so specifically because of that Gnostic thought that we mentioned earlier, earlier that they could attain this higher spiritual understanding or enlightenment, and yet it would be disconnected from the sinful body, the acts of the body. And while he's just pointed out that the true believer will walk in the light, now he states that the true believer will have sin in his life, but he will recognize and he will acknowledge that sin. You know, if we take this assertion and put it beside other verses that we see later on, that in, later on in John, 1 John, there are verses that assert that the believer does not sin. But we'll have to clarify that meaning later on in some of those verses and what he means there. You know, we can draw the conclusion then that, that John is not teaching us about a sinless lifestyle, but that a life that still has sin in it, but it is a life that will be generally characterized by light and by righteousness. And again, he uses uh, present tenses, present tenses because he's describing the, the ongoing character of our life. So John is basically saying in here, he says that sinlessness in the believer in his nature or in his practice is not possible in this life. Paul in Galatians 5, 16 and 17 talks about walking by the Spirit and says you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. He says for these two what are in opposition to one another so that you may not do the things that you please. So there, there is a, a struggle. There's a struggle going on. John is saying that we are having sin in our lives but to claim that we have no sin shows that the truth is not in us. So there were some who were saying we have no sin. But then he says in verse 9, he says, but if we are confessing, there were some who would recognize their sinfulness. He says, if we are confessing, it's, it's an ongoing attitude and an activity of the believer. Confessing, you maybe you've. You've heard this word maybe described before. It's a, it's a compound word in the Greek, which literally kind of has the idea to say the same. So when we confess sin, we're basically understanding it, you know, what God calls to be sin. Not what man calls it to be sin, but what God calls to be sin. And saying the same thing about it, uh, as he calls it sin, we call it sin. So in essence, sin in a lot of ways is discerning the nature of God, and then discerning the nature of man. And, and, of course, those are going to be in great contrast, and we will see our sin as we do that. So God's desire for us is that we, const we are constantly sensitive to sin in our lives. He's wanting us to see our weakness and to see his power. He's wanting to see the ugliness of our lives, even though we're forgiven, he wants us to see how ugly we are in our flesh day by day and to see his perfection and, and see how that we are much we fall much short of that. 
The idea, I think, you know, when we sin that we should have in our hearts is one that does it burden your heart. Does it burden your heart when you sin? Uh, fathers, if you have an impatient word with your child, uh, and you walk away from that, does it, does it hurt your heart that you were impatient? Maybe a little harsh with your child uh, or with your wife or whatever. Many other ways. You know, just when we have sin in our lives, is it such that it burdens our heart? I think, you know, as we walk in a fuller and a closer relationship with the Father, it's going to involve more and more a confession of sin in our lives. Our, our prayer, you know, should be, Lord, open my eyes to see the sin in my life. Cause me to see that. Notice he says in verse 9, the accompanying condition with that forgiveness, with that confession. He says, if we are confessing our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, I don't know how some people in here may interpret that, and there are a number of different interpretations out there. But what I share may be a little different than maybe what you're used to hearing here. And we, we need to be careful to understand uh, John's intention. To confirm uh, what was I mentioned before, as John writes the letter, he is throughout the whole book contrasting the life of the true child of God with the life of the unbeliever. So here, what, he's, what is he doing here? He's clearly contrasting the true child of God who recognizes his sinfulness, right? With those who say they have no sin. He's not, I think, in verse 9, he's not describing the believer who confesses his sin to restore his fellowship with God. See, the, the context of John does not really support that. You know, there are many people say that if we are confessing our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins. And the cleansing and forgiveness here from, is a fellowship forgiveness. Um, but I don't, I don't think he's saying that as we, uh, our individual sins are forgiven only when they are confessed and then fellowship is restored. Uh, really, that's basically the, only, the way you would have to understand it, because if you understood it the other way and it was conditional in the sense of we're only forgiven when we confess our sins. He says, if we confess, then we're forgiven. Uh, then surely that wouldn't refer to the pardon of guilt, you know, that it gives us judgment of eternal life or eternal death. And uh, I, I think, you know, he's he's saying that there are those who do not admit their sinful condition. They are not forgiven. Why? Because they are not true, but truly believers. And then there are those who see their sin before God. And this is what characterizes the true child of God. And the child of God can know and have confidence that God has forgiven him. And any present or future sin is still covered under the blood. He's not forgiven necessarily because he confesses. He is forgiven because he is a child of God and the true child of God will confess his sin. I don't know if you understood that or not. Uh, the same idea in that uh, Jesus says, uh, when I looked at the, uh, what was that? Uh, if we continue in his word, then you are his disciples indeed. Uh, that, that same uh, relationship that you see there and that we continue his word not to obtain salvation or discipleship status, but that we continue in his word because we are disciples. So we confess our sins. Why? Because we are his children who are forgiven and cleansed totally by God. And the, the word that's used for forgiveness there uh, is... A word that generally throughout, you know, throughout the New Testament, as you look at that word, uh, it doesn't really lend itself to the idea of a fellowship type forgiveness. But it's, it's the basic word that's used primarily to indicate the pardon of guilt, the pardon of guilt in, relate, in, in, in regards to eternal life and eternal death. So God hates sin. It's against his very nature because he is light, right? What is our attitude? The believer should be discerning of sin in his life. His sin should burden his heart and he should desire to turn from it. The third test, the test of keeping his word or obedience. 
I've got you, this. There's several passages. We're just going to look at one, but you could look at the others uh, later if you wanted to. It's, but there are three sp- specific passages that would deal very uh, carefully with this. Chapter two, verses three through six, and then chapter three, verses four through ten, and then chapter five, verses two and three. But we'll look just at 2, 3 through 6. By this we know that we have come to know him, if we are keeping his commandments. The one who says, see that phrase again? The one who says, I have come to know him, and does not keep his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him the love of God has truly been perfected. By this we know that we are in him. The one who says he the one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. The true believer, the true child of God obeys God's word. He keeps his commandments, he walks in righteousness. He loves the truth and he seeks to know it. He welcomes the word of God into his life. The true believer is not going to be one who says, I don't want anything to do with the Bible. I don't read my Bible. I don't study it. I don't memorize or anything. Uh, The true child of God. And I want to clarify, maybe just be careful as I share these things. It's not that all of us will not fall into sin and sometimes significant sin, the believer in his life. But John is trying to give what is basically characteristic of the ongoing life of the child of God. Uh, but the, the child of God is going to seek after the word. Uh, he's going to feed on it. So he, he says, I'm going to paraphrase uh, verse 3 here. Uh, and basically looking at the, the words and, and the, the understanding of the words that he uses here and, and the tenses in which he explains this with. Uh, We could paraphrase this. He says, we have a present ongoing knowledge and understanding through our current experience, what we're experiencing in our daily lives now, that we have come to know him. We have entered into relationship with him in the past, and it's continuing on up until now. And this is confirmed because we are continuing to keep his commandments. he, He says that, you, you can have confidence that you know him because you are obeying him and obeying his word. And he uses the term commandments here. Uh, commandments here refers to specific instructions, uh, admonition, teaching, uh, principles. And notice he says, keep his commandments. Actually, in, in the Greek, it actually says the commandments of him, him being Christ. Notice if you read, if you look back in chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, you know, he says, we, what we have heard from the beginning and the life was manifested and we have seen, and he, he's talking about his interaction, John's previous interaction with Christ while he was here on this earth. Um, he says that we will keep his commandments. And I, I want to clarify, the, a lot of times when we say commandments, we, we tend to think Old Testament law and Old Testament commandments. And uh, I think that John is not using that in a sense of any reference to the law. Uh, as you look through the book of First John, you know, he doesn't make any attempt to equate the law with the commandments of Christ. Not that they they're not in agreement, and, and there is a place in how God's in God's uh, progressive revelation and how He brings all that to us for our benefit and for our instruction. And so this was teaching that was directly from Christ that John had experienced himself and that he had shared. And, of course, I think, you know, he might include that the other apostles would share through their writings, their letters, and their teaching. And if if you look at uh, one of the other ways, you know, we we could see that it's he's not talking about the law necessarily and all the Old Testament laws. Uh, The passage in chapter five uh, that I we didn't read, but he says, For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. Uh, <clears throat> you could compare that when Peter's at, uh, in chapter 15 of Acts, 
at uh, the, uh, well, my mind's, uh, when they were all getting together, you know, talking about uh, the Council of Jerusalem, they're talking about whether the Jews, the Gentiles, could believe and, and be a part of, of uh, the church. And Peter talks about the law being the yoke that we were unable to bear. And he talks about the law being burdensome. And uh, so John says that the commandments that we have from Christ uh, are not burdensome. So the one who has truly known him, who has truly known Christ, demonstrates this reality that he has known Christ when he obeys the word of God. So looking back to some point, you know, where, you know, you talked to a lot of people. Oh, yeah, back when I was such and such, I believed. Uh, and they look back to a particular moment of life. And a lot of people will do that when you talk with them. But when you look at the book of First John, what does he do? Does he ever even say, look back to a point? He's saying, what characterizes you now? Do you believe now and do you know him? And is it making a difference in your life? And uh, so looking back to some point where you believed or repented, uh, doesn't really have any validity uh, unless there's a change in your life, unless there is obedience to God's word. This parallels James' words. What is James' words? You know, he says, faith without works is dead. So, you know, in the true believer's life, there's always going to be, there is a, a point of initial faith and repentance. But the genuineness of this faith will be demonstrated by a general life of obedience. Profession means nothing if it is not validated or accompanied by evidence. And that's what he says. He says, uh, the words are a lie. He says the truth in verse 4. He says, the one who says, I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is what? Is a liar and the truth is not in him. In contrast, in verse 5, but whoever keeps his word, in him the love of God has truly been perfected. By this we know that we are in him. It says, whoever keeps his word in him, the love of God has truly been perfected. In him, is, there, there's an internal work that has been wrought in a person's life. And he says, the love of God has truly been perfected. You could take this love of God, it could be either mean the idea of our love for God or the love that is produced in us by God. And the word perfected there doesn't have the idea of perfection as you know, spotless and perfect. It's more the idea of, you could translate it actually, the love of God has truly been realized. So keeping his word is not seen as a duty or an obligation. What? It's seen what? As an outflowing of the love of God, the love of God that he has worked in our hearts. And, and that's what Christianity is all about. It's not living a certain way. It's living a life because there is a living Christ within us. And he has changed us. And it is flowing out. And this love that's there desires to please him. You know, therefore, you know, it's moving us to, to walk in his ways. Fourth test, the test of love. And again, there's several passages on this, and we'll, we'll look at a couple of these. Uh, 2, 9 through 11, 3, 14 through 18, and then uh, chapter 4, verse 8. Let's read 2, 9 through 11. The one who says he is in the light and yet hates his brother is in darkness until now. The one who loves his brother abides in the light and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But the one who hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. The true believer will love other believers. He prays for them. He seeks their welfare. And he desires to edify them in their walk with Christ. When they have needs, he will want to help meet those needs. And he will want to worship and minister with them. Notice again, John says in verse 9, 
the one who says, there's the profession. The profession is contrasted again with the reality in that person's life. We spoke of the idea of light earlier. He says the one who says he is in the light uh, and yet hates his brother is in darkness. Hatred has no place in the life of the believer. So in a one who has a heart of hatred toward others, especially his brother or sister in Christ, you know, professing brother or sister Christ to him, I guess, uh, needs to question whether or not they're a true believer. Uh, the, the, he's saying that the true believer will not hate his brother or sister in Christ. And he says he abides in darkness. And let's turn to chapter 3, verses 14 through 18, and read those briefly. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brethren. He who does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. We know by this that he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whatever, but whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? Little children, let us not love with word or with tongue, but in deed and truth. Again, John uses the present ongoing understanding. He says, everyone who is hating. It's a present tense ongoing. And he's not saying that if you've ever had just this one moment of hate towards someone, then you're, you're not a true believer. But he's saying this is not going to characterize the believer's life. He equates hatred with murder. He says the heart that hates a brother is also capable of murders, but is basically what John kind of draws the conclusion there. You know, a little bit similar to what uh, Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5. The heart that hates is a selfish heart seeking its own benefit, but harm to another. In verse 16, we see the nature of a heart of love. He uses the example of Christ in verse 16. He laid down his life for us. Christ's actions demonstrated a sacrificial love. And we are to follow that example. In verse 17, love involves a willingness to set aside our own desires and our own needs to meet the needs of other believers. Philippians 2, 3, and 4 says, Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. The focus here is on believers. Uh, you know, generally, many times you see there's a priority. We are to meet the needs of other believers first, and then the believers of, of I mean, those who are of the world. Galatians 16 you know, says, So then, while we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who are of the household of the faith. Verse 18, he says, Little children, let us not love with word or with tongue, but in deed and truth. John's not saying we shouldn't work, we shouldn't love with our words. Uh, you know, we should definitely be encouraging and challenging and comforting in our words. But what John is addressing, he's addressing the one whose words are not accompanied by action. Uh, James, you might remember the, the words of James. He says, if a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to him, go in peace, be warmed and be filled. And yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body. What use is that? Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. So we see then that the true believer will love his brother. But we want to clarify the meaning of that. We've seen that it is sacrificial, putting others before ourselves. In verse 17, it meets the needs uh, of, of brothers. And, uh, but primarily when we love others, I think we need to see that the, the overriding end that we should have in that is what? To point them to Christ, right? The overriding end of our love is to point them to Christ. You know, love is not necessarily helping somebody to be happy or content or to be comfortable. 
We know that when the Lord loves us, what Hebrews 12, 6, for the whom the Lord loves, he chastens. And of course, we see all throughout the New Testament, there's Paul challenges us to exhort and admonish other believers and other brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, love, then, is not necessarily a, a warm and fuzzy thing, but that, that thing that will edify another in his walk with Christ. I like uh, a good verse to maybe to memorize a Proverbs, if you mem- like memorizing Proverbs, is uh, 27, 5, and 6. It says, Better is open rebuke than love that is concealed. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but deceitful are the kisses of an enemy. Talking about the, the, the tough nature uh, of, of love and uh, its need to, to point someone to Christ, even if it may be something that's hard to do. Uh, it, you know, sometimes love, it means correction. It means admonition. But one thing we, as we leave this is that our love for our brothers and sisters must always be guided by the truth. And uh, you know, we see uh, Paul mentions in Ephesians speaking the truth in love. Uh, the fifth test, the fifth test being the test of separation or worldliness. Move through these last ones a, a little bit quick, more quickly. Chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. Do not love the world, neither the things that are in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. The world is passing away and also its lust. But the one who does the will of God lives forever. The true believer's heart is not going to be captured by the things of this world. The desires and the allurements of this world, they're not going to fill his life. His satisfaction comes in knowing Christ, not in the things that have no eternal value. Remember, we we talked about the parable of the sower and the one that fell uh, on rocky places. But then there was the one that fell and the thorns came up and choked it out. And what were those thorns? It says that they were the worries, the riches and the desires of the world. And they they choked it out. And what ended up happening? That seed there was unfruitful. There was no fruit from it. The, the true believer needs to understand that his citizenship uh, is in heaven. Uh, one, a verse that I really like in, in Colossians is, Set your mind on things above, not on things that are on the earth. He says, For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And as we look in the verses here, just briefly, in verse 16, the believer is going to be tempted in a number of ways. What does he list there in verse 16? He says, the lust of the flesh, those things that appeal to our physical and sensual desires. The lust of the eyes, I think we could say things that lure us into greed, into self-satisfaction. And you could really expand on these in in a lot of ways in, in practical application. And he talks about the boastful pride of life. I think... Those things that will elevate our worth, our sufficiency, rather than our dependency upon God. And then he says that the things of this world only have temporary satisfaction and benefit. So the true believer sees and understands this and seeks after the things of God. Those things which have eternal value and benefit. So I think as believers, as we walk through, and this world is becoming worse and worse. I mean, we're seeing so much going on nowadays. It's pretty crazy, isn't it? And he's, he's asking us and telling us that you need to have discerning eyes as believers as we walk through this world. Um, so that you can see these different ways in which the world is going to lure us away from Christ. And understanding the big picture. Sometimes there's subtle ways in which the world is influencing us. And bringing temptation before us that we don't actually see unless you kind of see the whole big picture and put it together. Matthew 6, and Jesus says, Do not store for yourselves treasures in, on earth where moth and rust corrupt and where thieves do not break through and steal. And he says, But store for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not corrupt and where thieves do not break through and steal. He says, For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. That's the same thing John is, is basically saying. Uh, If you love the Father, 
then you will not love the world. Otherwise, he says, what? The love of the Father is not in you. Six, the test of truth. The true, uh, and uh, you can look at chapter 2, and this is going to be verses 18 through 27. And then will, there'll be chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. I probably could have made two, two messages out of this. I kind of having to push through some of this uh, a little more quickly. Uh, chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, and then verse 15. The true believer will discern and believe the truth concerning Jesus Christ, his person and his work, you know, what Christ has done and who he is. He will not be led, misled by false teaching. So John addresses several specific aspects. Let's look at verses 18 through 27 uh, quickly. Children, it is the last hour, and just as you heard that Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have appeared. From this we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not really of us. For if they had been of us, they would have remained with us. But they went out so that it would be shown that they are all not of us. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you all know. I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it, and because no lie is of the truth. Who is the liar but the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father. The one who confesses the Son has the Father also. As for you, let that abide in you which you heard from the beginning. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you also will abide in the Son and in the Father. This is the promise which he himself made to us, eternal life. These things I have, have I written to you concerning those who are trying to deceive you. As for you, the anointing which you receive from him abides in you, and you have no need for anyone to teach you. But his anointing teaches you about all things, and is true and is not a lie. And just as it is taught you, you abide in him. So Paul speaks, he spoke, he speaks of Antichrist. And this word is only used by John. It's not even used in Revelation. It's, it's all here in uh, 1 John, where he uses the term Antichrist. He groups it with uh, false apostles in, in chapter 4, verse 1. These are those who are going to be against Christ. Uh, so the, he's talking about these Antichrists. And then in 22, he says, Who is the liar but the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ? So, first of all, the believer is going to be one who confesses that Jesus is the only Messiah, the Christ, the anointed of God, and that he is one with the Father. And then, uh, if we look in chapter 4, verse 2, he says, By this you know that the Spirit of God, every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, is from God. Remember, I, I mentioned that the Gnostics didn't believe that Jesus took on a human body. Uh, the Greek word is dokeo, and they, there was a, a, a branch of that, and it's called asceticism. They only, Christ seemed to have a body. He didn't really have a body. So maybe John is addressing that, possibly. And so, uh, and then in, in chapter 4, verse 15, he says, whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God. And what does that phrase, Son of God, mean? In reference to Christ. Remember when Jesus was talking with, uh, in chapter 8 of John, uh, with the Pharisees, you know, and, and he claims to be the Son of God, and he says that your Father is the devil. And when Jesus called himself to be one with the Father and that he was the Son of God, they took it to be him claiming that he was deity, that he was God himself. You know, and he said in, in, at the end there, he says, Before Abraham was born, I am. It says they picked up stones to throw at him, and he, and, he, and he fled. So we see in 1 John that the true believer will, will proclaim that Jesus is the anointed Messiah, that he has come in the flesh, and that he is the Son of God. And then if you wanted to just, you know, chapter 2, verse 2, uh, an aspect that he points out concerning the work of Christ, what does it say there? He is what? The, the propitiation for our sins. We see the saving work of uh, of Christ. And I want to just point out very briefly the. You may be wondering, what does John mean when he says you have an anointing? 
Uh, you know, in a lot of groups, that people who there's this idea that the anointing of the Spirit is some special movement of God on an individual believer. But you know, it's it's weird. This word anoint, uh, the noun that's used here, it's the only time it's used in the whole New Testament is here in First John. And the verb is only used five times, and four of those actually refer to Jesus Christ being the anointed. And the only other place is in 2 Corinthians 1.21, where he's talking about all believers who have the earnest of the Spirit. The, the, they're indwelt by the Spirit as that earnest money for that eternal life that will be forever. Uh, and it's referring to all believers. So, really, all of us have the indwelling presence of the Spirit, and what he's, I think John is saying is that you will not deny the Christ, the truth about Christ, because the Spirit of God has anointed you with that truth and you will understand it and not reject it. And uh, we have His indwelling presence and guidance uh, and we will never reject the truth about Jesus Christ. Then we're just going to kind of hit on these very lightly. The, the, the seventh test is the test of hope or expectation. I, if we look at uh, chapter 2, 28 through 3, 3, um, you will see there that the one who believes in Christ, the one who is a true child of God, what is his, his heart, what is his attitude toward the coming of Christ? He will have confidence and he will look forward to that. You know, and I think that's something that, that God wants us to have on our hearts is that hopefully every day we, we're saying, Lord Jesus, you know, come soon. And we're, we have expectation toward that day. Then the eighth test would be the test of prayer. Uh, he mentions this just a little bit in, in chapter 3, verses 19 through 22, and chapter 5, verses 14 and 15. Uh, I think, you know, the true believer will seek the Lord in prayer. You know, sincere prayer is an indication of a heart of humility and dependence. If you're going to the Lord in prayer, uh, in sincere prayer, you're looking to Him in, in great dependence. And one, good impre- one important principle we learn from the book of 1 John uh, is in 5.14 where you know, he says that we are to pray how? According to His will. So all prayer is, that's one principle that is an important principle we learn in the book of John. Uh, and then the last uh, test would be the test of perseverance. The true believer will persevere to the end. Uh, we read that just a minute ago in uh, chapter 2, verses 18 through 20. Remember he says, they went out from us but they were not really of us. For if they had been of us, they would have remained with us. He says, if they had been truly children of God, they would have remained. And then uh, at the very end, in uh, uh, actually, I wish I could spend more time on that because there's some, some good stuff there. But just to briefly mention in chapter 5, verse 18, he says, we know that no one who is born of God sins, but he who is born of God keeps him and the evil one does not touch him. And uh, uh, one of my favorite uh, passages that goes along with that is 1 Peter 1, 3-5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, and especially this last phrase and how it relates to First John here, who are protected, what? Protected by the power of God through faith. Here he says, Christ, the one who is born of God, keeps him, keeps the believer, and the evil one does not touch him. The true child of God will persevere to the end because it's not in our hands, it's in his hands, right? Amen. If it was our hands, we'd be in trouble. So we see the different tests of life. The tests of light, uh, confession of our sin, obedience to His Word, love for brothers, separation from the world, knowing the truth about Christ, hope of His return, prayer, and then persevering. So just to bring this into what I mentioned before, a clear application. 
Maybe some of you have gone through some of these things in your own heart, in your own mind, uh, and it raises questions as to whether you do truly know Him, that you can answer affirmatively what John says to them when he says, these things have I written unto you that you may know. And you can say, I do know, but maybe you're one of those who says, I don't really know. And this, would, this raises a serious question about whether or not you truly know Christ. And then also, uh, I do have a little track. I mean, if anybody ever wanted any copies, I shared this with folks at work who profess, they profess to be believers and stuff so that they can have a little bit of God's Word before them in a very brief, uh, uh, brief form. Uh, maybe God can use some of these things to enable you to uh, have a tool as you share with other, other people who profess to know Christ, but there is no fruit in their lives. And then, of course, all these different things can be more and more uh, full and, and present in our lives, uh, knowing the truth, walking in the light, loving one another, and just taking all these things and, say, and asking the Lord to, to work them in a much greater way in our own life uh, uh, is a great application that we could uh, take from this today. Let's pray. Father, we, we thank you for your word. Went through a lot of stuff, and I just pray that uh, uh, maybe all of us would go back and we could look at some more of these verses in depth a little bit more. And, and Lord, you would just work in each heart that is here. And Lord, if, if one thing, it just gives us maybe a, a greater hunger to seek you through your word. And uh, we just thank you for this time together. I, I pray that uh, it will be a profitable time in all of our hearts. And I pray in Christ's name. Amen.